Hey everyone, I've got a great guest today. And he's direct from the bold and beautiful dressing room of Matthew Atkinson, who's killing it, Thomas Forrester. Um, and uh, all mannequins around America are scared of Thomas right now. And, um, and Matthew, I was gonna have the Hope Mannequin join us, but her connection was not good because you kind of stuffed her Thomas stuffed her in the box for a bit and then she well she need, you know what she needs to take a little bit of a timeout okay <laughs> she's getting all the attention I want a little bit over here like like somebody pay attention to Thomas so it's just us um <laughs> so first of all Matthew mm -hmm. so you, you find out this story is happening that Thomas is going to be like talking to this mannequin and obviously the show was using mannequins as part of their kind of reboot when they had to deal with COVID-19 protocols to come back. So right. you were aware that this was inspired by that? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, yeah, it makes, and it makes complete and total sense. We've got a lot, of, um, uh, a, a lot of news outlets started picking up this story and they found it interesting and because it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of weird to watch uh, you know, we're trying to make movie magic in, in, in a little bit of a way, but, um, you know, you could tell in some of the scenes when, in our earlier scenes when we're trying to, the person leans in and they're going to kiss and you can tell it's a little bit of a mannequin. It's kind of goofy and weird and it's, it's funny. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, uh, we got, I think that we got so much coverage because of it and, and it, people found this so interesting that we were trying to, you know, make this work in this sort of interesting way that um, we ended up, well, Brad ended up grabbing that idea and running with it and throwing it into the storyline, which is sort of ingenious. You know, when you think about it, you sort of have this um, to, to actually make it a part of the story without having to talk about the, you know, the, <laughs> the sort of sad or depressing or the thing that th the people don't actually want to think about or talk about because they've been dealing with it for so long. We can still make this uh, this scenario a part of the story um in, in an interesting way and and to uh kind of take thomas down this 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 path um and uh sort of enter a realm that people maybe should be talking about a little bit more with uh with mental health and sort of uh you can tell that he's he's really suffering and um so it's interesting that they found a way to implement it into the story and to make it interesting and to make it sort of about something that that we should talk about a little bit more so when you, as you're playing this, you knew you have known how much did they tell you? I mean, without you can't obviously divulge it to me or anybody. Yeah. But do you know what is causing all of this in Thomas? Like what is going on? Because we're watching, thinking he's had a psychotic break, he's being drugged. Sure. You know, we don't know. We just, you know. So yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it definitely, I see why it comes across that way. And, and, <laughs> and yes, I do know why uh, Thomas is, is going through this. Uh, I, I won't say exactly why, um, but, you know, I did, uh, I, have, I did talk about, I think at one point I said in an interview, uh, and, and someone picked it up and ran with it and, um, and sort of made it like it's a real thing, but I didn't necessarily say it this way. But what I said was the, that... Um, what Thomas is suffering with could only be described as paranoid schizophrenia. Um, now that isn't me saying it's paranoid schizophrenia. That's me saying that, that objectively looking at it, the symptoms he's dealing with, uh, you would have to say is that, um, you know, I, I won't give the reason or what exactly is going on. It may be that it may be something else, but we definitely know that he's suffering with something, uh, greatly. And, um, I think I think that that definitely comes through when you're watching the show, and uh, it'll be an interesting sort of uh, thriller scenario. You're trying to figure out exactly what it is that's causing this this breakdown. You know, and what's really interesting is the fans love to guess. Like they're in a like there's oh I've yeah brain tumor, paranoid schizophrenia. You know, draw being mm -hmm. drugged by somebody. There are a lot of theories out there. Yeah, but I think that's the fun of it. And as you said they are filming this kind of like a thriller, just the angles they are going in on you and like how they're doing it, right? So did do yeah. you like that aspect of it or do you think it's hard to pull off on daytime? No, I know I, I, I kind of do. Um, I think it's it's sort of fun because we, we're, we're in a forum where we get to tell all different kinds of interesting stories that you maybe wouldn't necessarily tell all on the same show. Like usually these would be different projects. You would work on something that might be, you know, 
the the mob boss film and then you might be working on the the romantic comedy and then you might be working on the the thriller uh or the psychological thriller and and we're able to sort of delve into different mediums in a weird way just because of how soap operas always have been able to tell their stories um and and i, I was i was pretty excited that they went i mean i wasn't sure at the beginning i thought that it could go one of two ways you know it could be very very dark like sort of psychological thriller like what's seriously wrong with this guy or it could go kind of a goofy way you know it could be we could make a comedy out of this because the situation is so ridiculous that it's like it's it's kind of one or the other and um you know i think that it's 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 interesting that they t took this direction because you have we're using the character thomas that um obviously has been suffering with a lot of uh, issues and ramifications of, you know, sort of his childhood and, and the things he's experienced through his life. And he's sort of working through those things now as he's hitting that sort of age of, of he's becoming a father and he's sort of out of being, you know, out of adolescence. He's through, you know, kind of his twenties and his, his phases with that. And he's getting to the stage where a lot of people go through a ma massive change in their life. And that's when he's dealing with all of these issues that are uh, were so prevalent in his past. So let's talk about what happened and how you get through these scenes. For instance, so here comes the Hope Mannequin. They said, here's your scene partner. Uh -huh. What was your reaction to that, like seeing it and then like having to do these scenes with it? And did it stay up or was it falling down? Like what happened? When <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's been, a, it's a learning curve, uh, you know, working with a, 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 doll. a doll. I mean, I, you know, how else do you, it's an inanimate object. It's very hard to play off an inanimate, but at the same time, um, you know, when I first saw it, uh, it was creepy and weird because it doesn't, you see it in person. I think you can tell when you see it on, on the show. You, you know it's supposed to be Annika, but, but you know that, it, that, that there's something wrong with it. It's like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's like they, they took Annika and then they possessed her with something. You know something's very wrong and off about it, but it, the, the likeness is very similar. Um, but I would say, I mean, Annika's obviously way more beautiful than the doll is. Um, I mean, even, I, I don't think it's that accurate, but at the same time, it's like, it's enough like her to know it's her and it's enough night like her to be really creepy. And that kind of comes through and works in those scenes and also is, is informative for Thomas or for, well, really for me as the actor when I'm doing those scenes, because I've done the scenes with where they put the mannequin in because, uh, you know, Torsten's supposed to be basically four feet from me. And we're having a short conversation and, you know, looking over at him and they would put a mannequin there because they couldn't have us that close and talking to a mannequin or, or even a mark on the wall as if it's a real human being, you're not able to react. You're not able to take in what, what they're saying or how they're saying it or any of that stuff. You're making it all up in your head versus here. It's like a legitimate situation. Like it's actually not that hard to talk to a mannequin when it's supposed to be a mannequin, because it makes sense that it's very, very weird and that it's not supposed to be happening. Okay, so it is my understanding that you're on set and Annika is like 20 feet away and is she throwing lines at you? Like, is she doing the lines of the doll? Like, are you hearing that in- Yeah, she's time? hit me in the head a couple of times too. And it's it's kind of painful. She keeps throwing the, the lines at me. Oh, um, and uh, she just crumples up the paper and then puts a rock inside of it. And it's really painful um how no, far yeah she's 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 probably 20 uh, well it depends each each set is uh, you know it's it depends on where they have to have the cameras and stuff like that so they try and get her as close as possible just for so i can hear her but she's obviously uh she's at least 15 to 20 feet away if not 30 uh during those scenes so i think that they're actually harder scenes for her to shoot because she has to she's trying to do this thing you know she's trying to create this personality that's not hope i mean it's this, it's its own thing it's a mannequin that is you know sort of possessed in a very weird way you're gonna hear you'll hear weird things 10 minutes and we're coming back item 23 can't tell you what item 23 is but it's going to be intense um but no, no no we have uh I, I we she's she's pretty close and so that i can hear her but it, it is a little tough so we got to make sure that everyone stays really really quiet so that i can actually hear the lines coming from her 
And then, you know, I, I just basically am pretending that it's the mannequin saying them and I'm, you know, um, but it's a, it's been a fun, interesting process for sure. Uh, for sure. Now, just now, have you had the big moment, the moments when you're just laughing so hard or do you do that before the scene to get it out? Where does the ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I use, okay. So <laughs> the way that I, that I usually work is, is when, you know, when it's scenes like this that are kind of heavy and dark and this guy's going through something uh, pretty traumatic i usually kind of try and stay in that place because it's very hard to switch back and forth but um with these scenes because how long it takes to shoot these scenes because yeah the mannequin sometimes does fall it doesn't stay where you want it to stay all the time and it, it sometimes it's not positioned how they want it to look on camera and whatnot so these these scenes took kind of a long time to shoot and I realized that it, I mean, it's, it's, it takes its toll emotionally on you to stay in that place for a long period of time. So what I actually sort of halfway through, I transitioned into, I made it sort of a game for myself, how quickly I could get back into it. Because I was like, I had to find some, some lightness and some, some positivity and have fun in between takes. So like toward the end of us shooting these scenes, it would be, you know, me and Monica goofing off and joking around. And, you know, I, half the time, I don't even know if I said the actual lines in rehearsal i was just saying goofy off the wall stuff and then we would you know then we would go action and i would do it um but yeah i mean it was it was definitely a, an interesting process learning how to deal with that especially when we're shooting such long days and thomas is in such um an insane sort of uh mind frame have you watched back your work on it have you watched episodes back with how this is coming off on camera or do you not look uh, at so I'm, I don't know. I go back and forth on this. So I, I, I watch a little bit. I want to, I want to see it all at some point. Um, but sometimes I don't want, especially when I'm still, if we're still shooting a storyline, um, I don't want to go back and watch what sort of how it's coming across in the beginning. Cause I don't, I really don't, I don't want to see. I don't, maybe I don't even know why I do it. It's like, I could see it and probably it wouldn't affect me too much. But for some reason, I have a feeling that if I was watching it when it was while I'm still doing that storyline, it, it's going to um, it somehow affect my work in some way and going into the future. Um, so in a lot of ways, I don't. I've seen uh, a couple of scenes from just to see like because I was so interested to, to see how this process was coming together because I shot all this stuff. But. And I knew that they were doing certain things with the camera, but I didn't see a take. I didn't see one little piece of, I didn't see dailies, nothing. And uh, so I basically just had Annika telling me how the stuff looked. And she was like, oh, when they shot that scene and they had the camera like this, it was like really cool or da da da. And the way she described it to me gave me a sense of what it was going to come across as. But I sort of just, you know, um, I just kept my head down, did my work and, and hoped that it, uh, it all worked out in the end. And from what I'm seeing now, like, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it's definitely, uh, it's an interesting storyline to be watching. Um, and especially since, uh, you know, it's me, but it's not me. I mean, it's Thomas, but at okay. the same time, it's like, you know, I'm watching myself literally lose my own mind. So right. um, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of weird in that way, but I, I do, I have I actually enjoyed what I've seen so far uh specifically with with uh the way that we're we're sort of seeing thomas really suffering with with what he's actually seeing and dealing with i mean the audience is sort of privy to what thomas is actually experiencing and i think that when you add a little bit of empathy to that and you put yourself in thomas's shoes you go you know if i started hearing something talking to me like this and it was telling me these sorts of things like i would you know not be sleeping and i would be losing my mind too and i think you see that in the especially the first episodes you see thomas is really tired and he just he's because he's not sleeping he's literally getting no winks of sleep at night and uh his mind is totally focused on this and i think it's just taking a huge toll so we the mannequin told uh him to kill liam and I, you know so now i believe thomas is thinking i gotta kill liam because she told me to kill him like is is or is he questioning like oh my god why did she say that like i think he's questioning i think that the whole time that you're watching thomas suffer with this um thomas i think as, as maybe as hard as it is to believe is is thinking this through 
the same way the audience is because the audience is getting kind of blindsided by this as well, you know, by, by what he's feeling and what he's hearing. Um, I, I mean, obviously it affects him differently because this is Thomas we're talking about and he can't stand Liam. And, you know, he, he does kind of, he's like, yeah, things would be better for Steffi and Hope if he wasn't around. But at the same time, um, I think that he genuinely is, has been trying to be a better person. I think he's been on his way to being that. And, uh, and now he's suffering with this and he doesn't know why. And it feels like that, um, you know, he can't seem to avoid the obstacles and he can't seem to avoid, uh, you know, something, something massive taking place in his life that is, that's changing him. And he wishes he could just be normal. There was this, the scene when Liam is saying to hope, He's literally mouth open, like he, she, he cannot believe he she's rationalizing, you know, the weirdness of Thomas's behavior and and like that she got him, you know, back to design for him. And he's just literally like, what? Right. He's trying to say something's wrong with this guy and nobody's right. listening. Well, what's funny is, is, I mean, and, and this is true, both Brooke and Liam they seem to, without any evidence whatsoever, they seem to just know what is going on behind closed doors. <laughs> they just randomly have like, uh, I, I, it's it's insane. Like they, they're they're psychics or something because for basically a year there was no indication to Brooke that she knew that that Thomas was obsessed with Hope. She just kind of guessed it the whole time and happened to be right. And and Liam sort of is like that now too because I mean to everyone else it looks like Thomas is sort of moved on and he's not still obsessed with hope and the way the way he communicates with her is not in a way that that you can tell you know behind his eyes he's thinking about having her or whatnot like he's not thinking those things so so i think that hope is perceiving change in him and i think that steffi's doing that as well and then liam comes in the door and he's saying no the guy's crazy you gotta listen to me <laughs> and it's like it's like well is he right does he is he does he happen to be right or does he actually see something in Thomas that's, you know, because when he goes over there and he sees the mannequin, only Liam, I mean, Thomas did a good job, I think, in justifying oh. <laughs> uh, why he had a mannequin there. And, and to the point that you see Steffi and Hope kind of go, well, he's been doing great designs. And it started after he took the mannequin, he says he's got inspiration. He's an artist. I don't know. Like, artists do weird things like what well, you know it's like but that doesn't necessarily prove he's obsessed with her and, and Liam's over there going what are you what's wrong with you <laughs> and um Liam maybe is right but maybe he's not you know and in the, but in this situation it's like I think that there's there's that's what's fun about these stories because you have uh the people that side with Liam 100% and they're like Thomas is crazy like listen to Liam and then you have everyone else is going no, no no Thomas is suffering with this like something's wrong here and he needs help and and it's not he's not actually obsessed with her anymore and and Liam's got this all wrong and something you know he's going to end up beating the crap out of Thomas and Thomas is you know uh, suffering with with a real mental uh, illness you know it's like well, there's there's two sides of it and I think that you have the fans sort of um they're siding up with both sides you know and it, it's interesting to watch that but tell me about working with Scott because you two have had the fights on the roof the fist fights the this oh yeah characters have been what is it like when you two have to go at it or have this adversarial thing and do you guys have fun doing it or do you oh, go through yeah. it? I mean, what's it like being you guys doing that and then going to your separate corner or like leaving the set that day? Well, I mean, I love Scott to death and, and, and we have so much fun working together. So like, well, we, and we more than probably any other two actors on the show, probably when we're shooting together, we just goof around we're constantly goofing around and giving each other crap and because of that i mean it makes those scenes sort of fun because you go straight from us you know just goofing off and laughing like no other and then immediately into hating each other but at the same way like we just i think we both love shooting those scenes and we both love getting to really get into it and 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 really express these characters points of views and and uh and, and especially with the action stuff and, and being, you know, running around here, we're going, you're running up to the rooftop, we're getting into a fight, all that stuff. Um, it was so fun for us. I mean, it's like, and it's not only that, it's like, and I think it would be fun for anyone on this show to, because we don't always get to do that kind of stuff. We're not always on location. We're not always, you know, it's, it's a lot of, you know, we're in the office, we're having conversations. We're, we're going to this house and we're having conversations. Every once in a while we get into it. 
but to go to that extreme and to be able to shoot like on location and and to have like fight scenes i mean we the time we had the fight on the rooftop like all that stuff was choreographed in about 10 minutes we had to basically meet wow. the stunt guys in between shooting i mean we we had a lot of we shot like three episodes or four episodes in one day at one point that week and uh so we're you know running on fumes and we're just trying to remember what the heck we're supposed to say in our next monologue or whatever it is and and uh but in lunch we didn't even have time to eat but they basically were like hey we're shooting these fight scenes later and we got to get you to meet with the stunt guys so we met with the stunt guys and and choreographed this whole thing and it's like a you know it's it's probably a 14 15 point um sort of action sequence that you know you you usually would have a few days to get down and and we had you know less than half an hour uh but at the same time that that thrill of being able to do it and and learning it and doing something different was so much fun for both of us i don't think we would have had it any other way now annika noel so so hope comes and sees thomas with the mannequin and he is does is he like squirmishing in his mind at that moment or is he like i'm just going to explain that this is my inspir like how does he feel in that moment when she is clearly found out his little secret so she thinks well i think in those scenes this is interesting so what i think is happening in these scenes and the way that the way that at least that um i prepped it and the way we shot it um was not so much that um because this is at a point where thomas has been suffering with this for days on end he hasn't slept in probably a week right and you, I mean, the ramifications of what that does to your brain, but but also your uh, you know ability to even conceptualize what's real and what's not, which is obviously already in flux for him. He's he's from day one, he doesn't know what's real and what's not. So uh, you add in that sleep deprivation and the fact that he's been going through it for this long. I think he is at a point where he's just trying to survive. He just doesn't he doesn't know why this is happening. He doesn't he can't think through things thoroughly. I think he's just like when things come at him, he's just trying to maybe defend himself and keep himself from from just passing out at any point in time. And so when you have Liam coming, when you have Hope coming to him, you know, yeah, he's he's Thomas is obviously in the past has been a master manipulator and he's very, very smart. He's a smart guy. He's able to think on his feet. But I think in this situation, it's not that he's he's rustled with anything. I think that it's his natural inclination to try and uh, protect himself in one way or another and try and rationalize what everyone else is seeing in some way, uh, all while just trying to stay awake and trying to make it through the day. But he is covering up to her. He's not saying, I'm oh, here. yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is Thomas we're talking about. He knows that this looks crazy and he's he's smart. So he, he'll come up with stuff on the fly to make it seem logical. Um, and in a way it is logical because he has been so, he's basically taken every ounce of his, his body and, and his mind and put it into his work because this is happening to him. And he's trying to do anything he knows how to do. And what he knows how to do best is design. And so he focuses all his energy on that. And so there is a reality there that, yeah, the reason he's doing it is because of the mannequin. It's not because it's necessarily inspiring him. It's forcing him to to do this. But he's he's justifying that and then also trying to use that as an explanation to everyone else to to you know give him some leeway. Does he want hope back? And does he want his son Douglas back in his life as his as his true dad? Like does he want that? Or does, oh. or does he think at this point, there's something so wrong with me? I don't, you know, what's happening with all of that in his head, do you think? Well, I mean, I think that uh, as far as want goes, uh, I think that he desperately wants uh, his son back in his life. And I think that he, he still 100% believes that if he could have the family that he never had, it would be better for Douglas. And he wants to do this all for Douglas. I mean, from the very beginning, the, the whole obsession starting with going after Hope wasn't about Thomas over the top, loved her and was obsessed with her. It was about, he lost the mother to his child and needed to find a way to give his child what he never had. 
and he got obsessed with that. And in the in during that time, he saw the relationship grow between Hope and his child, and he fell in love with her again based on that. But I but I, I don't think that it was always about that. And um, and I think the same thing's kind of true now that that yeah, his focus one hundred percent what he wants is is what's best for his child. But now I think with what he's seriously suffering with, he's questioning his own ability to yeah to be a dad to be a husband to be a human being that's functional in society and to not somehow let his father down which he you know has spent his entire life uh sort of obsessing over in his own head um and so he's struggling with all these things at once annika uh what would you say about working with her and has she been an amazing scene partner because she has to constantly cry she has to constantly go through things over and over again because you're on a you're on a half hour show. You have 19 minutes. You have to like yeah. do. There's so much repetition in soaps, just the way you have to set up the story. You know. Yeah. Uh, so does it get for you or her? Like, oh my god, we've got to do this again. You know, or. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, uh, but from day one, I mean, I've loved working with Annika and I tested with her. I did chemistry read with her uh, before I came on the show and we immediately started working together. You know, so my first few scenes were with sort of everybody and Thomas shows butt up and he's, you know, talking with everyone. But really, it starts filtering down to him spending time with with uh, Hope and, and his son and um, and that relationship. And so we me and Annika have worked together uh closely now since i got on the show um and i think anytime you're in the trenches with someone like that i mean we're, we're trying to make everything work the best that we can i mean it's this is not an easy um forum you know you show up and and you got to shoot we're shooting you know eight to ten episodes a week um it's a lot every day especially when you're heavy in the storyline which annika has been for years and so um you know, you're trying to, you're, you're basically just trying to help each other out as, as much as you can. And, uh, and I think that Annika and I have, have, uh, we work together really well. Um, you know, we have, we have our times where we, where we goof off and, you know, we'll make the fun of things or we'll try and, you know, I mean, it is sometimes it's like, it's tough because she's got to cry like, you know, five times this week and Thomas is losing his mind. So I'm screaming at a mannequin. It's like, you know, this stuff, <laughs> This is not easy stuff to shoot, so we got to find something to to kind of lighten up the load a little bit. And I think we we do that really well, and we were able to to help each other through those uh, those sort of tough times shooting. But at the same time, you know, it's it, she's one of the she's one of the um, the best sort of team players and and actors I've had the privilege of working with. If Thomas was well, he would want to be with Hope. Well, okay, so. If Thomas was well, he would want to be with Hope. Right now, I think that that's true. Um, I mean, who I think, I mean, if we're say like, who are the soulmates, right? Who Who is Thomas's soulmate? I would say from the history of the show before coming on, I would say Thomas and Sally uh, probably had the closest uh, connection and the, and the largest love of, of any uh, couple that Thomas has ever been uh, a part of. Um, but you know, now is a, is a different situation. And Sally was, um, you know, she, she wasn't that person that, uh, was able to be a mother to Douglas in, in that time. It was sort of hope sort of jumped right into that role naturally after not having her own child or, or, you know, not knowing that she had her own child. And so she felt a little bit motherless. Uh, you know, she was, there was a child she was expecting and, and no, it's no longer there. And so she, she kind of takes over as as Douglas's mother, and and Thomas sees that and 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 gravitates towards that. And I think that you know uh, that becomes way more important to Thomas than like necessarily his his selfish wants or needs uh, as a um, as a romantic partner. Um, so I think that it, that, it, that it grew from a place that necessarily wasn't you know them as soulmates, and he believes that. But I think that he convinced himself of that. And I think that they they could be a great couple together. And I think a lot of people see that. I think that, um, you know, Hope, Hope very much wants to be the one woman in her husband's life. She wants Liam to 
Stop being Get rid. Stop <laughs> going back to Steffi. Stop <laughs> acting like a husband to Steffi and just be the, yes, you're her child's father, but you are my husband and, and you have a, you have a child here. And so he, she didn't want, she, I think she desperately sort of wants that and she hasn't been getting it, but she's convincing herself that it's happening. And Thomas is this guy who, who has been offering that for years now. And um, so, and I think that in that way, they really would mesh well together and they could have this amazing life and family together. So, um, but we'll see what happens. So I, you know, kudos to you because uh, we've talked about this before, but I, you know, they put Thomas originally down a pretty dark path with the baby Beth storyline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, were there moments through it where you thought, okay, I'm being written off the show. <laughs> this is not going to go well. <laughs> I am um, saying because I think you've done this role so well that they were like, oh, we got to keep him going, you know, because when people do bad things, sometimes they can't redeem him, but they right. found ways to keep you going. Yeah, I mean, there were definitely times when, when I felt like, hey, we're, we're getting to a place where Thomas is really irredeemable. Um, and there were obviously times where, you know, it's like a script showed up and I read it and Thomas gets pushed off a cliff and then we had a week off. <laughs> so I wasn't getting scripts for a week. And I'm like, um, am I going, <laughs> uh, like the end of the script, this is Thomas gets pushed off a cliff. Like, uh, am I dead? Like, you know, so, cause that can happen, especially on a, you know, on a show like this, you can have a character, uh, it's not unrealistic to have a character die. Uh, it's also not unrealistic to have a character come back to life. It's not unrealistic for almost anything to happen. Did but you also at the get same time, vat of acid. What was the vat of hydraulic? What was the big thing? Uh, I think it was hydrofluoric. Was it hydrofluoric acid? Yes. Um, yeah, you, you almost got pushed into a vat of. Well, of course, they had replaced it with cleaning solution. Don't forget that. So he didn't fall into acid. I'm worried about the cleaning, cleaning I'm just solution. worried about these chemicals and head trauma and falls. Things have happened to Thomas. I'm just saying that. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, he's definitely had close calls, a lot of close calls, and uh, he's definitely been suffering through it. But, um, I, you know, I always, I, I'm an actor, you know, like I'm always ready for, not because I want it to be, but just the reality of the nature of my job that, that I might not be working next week. That's just the reality of what I do. Um, and so, uh you know, is it possible that that happens? Sure. So I'm always kind of ready for it. But at the same time, I think that um, we've created some pretty compelling stories with Thomas. And I also don't think that he's irredeemable. I think that he's, if anything, we've just showed different levels of, of uh, suffering. And I think that, that mostly what I see from the audience is they want him to get better. You know, they want him to be better. Some people love the drama, obviously, and, and really enjoy him you know, being a little crazy because it's fun. It's it's fun to watch and it's it's fun for me to do. Um, but at the same time, I don't think he's irredeemable. So I think that at the end of the day, uh, you know, I feel pretty confident that that Thomas is going to, uh, you know, be here going forward. But, you know, anything can happen. Well, remember Austin, the cameraman. I Who? Who's that? Wasn't he on okay. YR? Young and the Restless, right. Because um, I was like, wait. What happened to that guy? I don't know. <laughs> That's so weird. I, I, I feel like he, didn't he die or something? And, but that whole he was market. married to someone and he held a woman hostage at some point and ran away from the police, I think. He was a little screwed up, wasn't he? Um, you play It's that. sort of weird that, you know, I don't know, like in this, because if I remember right, Austin looked a lot like Thomas for some reason. Oh, wow. I, I don't know why. It, they were, I don't know. It's like, similar. it's like they look very They're similar. Very similar. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's weird because it's, it's, it is the same world. I mean, Sally is is in Genoa <laughs> City right now. now. So maybe she'll and just they, They've been talking about Thomas <laughs> over in Genoa City. I, 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 I think it would be interesting if they were twins. Summer saw a picture of Thomas Forrester she could definitely put together that resemblance. I don't know. It's just, that's beyond me. <laughs> so there is a scene that uh, Thomas is having dinner with the Hope Mannequin. Now I'm just saying this, this reaches new levels here. 
So he's having this, he, she's sitting there. What did you think of that scene? Did you not laugh during that scene? Or did you have to stay in it? That was, that, that, no, it was, that was a fun, that was just kind of a fun scene. That was honestly just like a fun scene. It's like in, you know, in the middle of the day, it's like, I got, to, I got to do this miniature play in between scenes that's called Dinner with a Mannequin. And it was just this, you know, it's like, it's sort of one of those, you, t you take it, it comes at you. It's like, so Thomas is, well, he's just giving in at this point. He's just, okay. I live with a, a mannequin now. All right, cool. Moving forward. Was the mannequin upright or did it fall over in the food in rehearsal? <laughs> no, actually it was upright. It was upright. And they gave me real food too. And you know, I can't stop eating. So I, I basically, I was just chowing down for like an hour. That was an awesome scene to shoot. I basically just sat there uh, just having conversation with a mannequin and eating food. It was great. So <laughs> what happens when you leave? You're done for the day. You've yeah. all been, you've been freaked out playing this character. Do you get in the car and go, okay, like, are you just done with it? Can you, are you shutting it off? Or how much well, is it home with you? Uh, no, I definitely don't take it home with me. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of, I would come back to my room and I would stay here for another hour or two after we were done shooting usually, even though a lot of those were late nights. I would usually stay here and, and work on the next day's material uh, while still sort of in that mind frame and thinking about the scenes we just shot and do the work on the, on the next uh, day scenes. And then I'd go home and uh, I'd completely pretend like I didn't have to do any of that all day. I would just go home. I would, you know, watch myself an episode of The Office. I would have uh, dinner with a real human being, maybe. <laughs> and then I would go to sleep and I would wake up the next day and prepare for it like any other day. And then I would get to work and have to go straight back into it. But I, I definitely didn't take it home with me. Are you impressed by how b, &B has gotten on its feet amid co the COVID-19? You know, was the first show back? As you know, you guys have protocols that you work with. Um, yeah. Are you impressed with what has gone on to keep you going? Or has it been like a, a hard a switch to deal with? Or um, well, it's interesting. It's sort of, it's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, it's, it's definitely been stressful at times and it makes, it definitely adds layers of, um, of complexity to your day because not only are, I mean, it's the same thing we're shooting, we're still shooting eight to 10 episodes a week. And uh, so we have all that material, but on top of that, um, you know, we've had to, uh, we've had a lot of more responsibility thrown on us uh, from, from not only the, the precautions we have to take with um we can't i can't just go over to annika's room or or us show up in hair and makeup to run lines we can't do that so like we're not even, and for the most part we're doing our own makeup now unless it's like a necessary thing where we have to have some makeup put on uh by a professional we're kind of doing our own stuff on that but it adds you know i, I don't know i've never put on uh any makeup in my entire life until I had to learn how to do this. So it was like, you know, that added a good 20, 30 minutes to my morning. And then we got on top of that, we're still shooting the same amount, but we got to meet somewhere that where we can distance ourselves. There's certain rooms where they put up plexiglass and we're able to go into and, um, and run lines and stuff, but they're halfway across the stages. So you got to take account for that if you're first up, especially. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, complexity to it, but at the same time, there's, there's times that we found, um, I think, and I don't know if this will continue this way, but I do feel like that we have, um, I think it's making everyone in, in sort of every industry reassess how they do business. We're finding the positivity within the constructs of what we have to accomplish. But at the same time, obviously there's a lot more restraints. We have to, you know, we're wearing masks all the time. We have specific ways we have to go on and off the stage. We can't do lots of things like we could before that were very efficient. And hopefully once this passes and we're able to get back to normal life, um, we'll not only have more efficient processes that we found during this process, but we'll be able to eliminate the stuff that we're needing to keep in place right now and maybe run the show even more efficiently and uh, take some stress off some people. Like you said, we were one of the, we were the first show back. The and first show I'm back. just so grateful to be a part of that and to be a part of all these people getting back to work. And I think it's necessary. So 
you know, hopefully we're able to keep that going, make sure everyone's safe and hopefully other shows follow that trend and, and other businesses too. And we're able to get a lot of people back to work. So in closing, what should we look forward to, you think, from Thomas moving forward here? What would you say to the viewers? Keep an eye out for, <laughs> keep an eye out for. Um, keep an eye out. For... <laughs> keep, keep an eye out. Just keep an eye out. Because Thomas, Thomas isn't closing his eyes, obviously. <laughs> he ain't sleeping. So his eyes are open, yours better be because. Uh, does it get you know, more, does it get more intense, would you say? Um, yeah, yes, I would say, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away, but I do, there's definitely, um, some very interesting and, and weird turns of events coming and you, you want to stay tuned because, uh, this, this story might, um, might end with a bang. Right now with the bank, I'm just worried there's going to be like a Liam mannequin and a different man. They're going to be like all these little mannequins. <laughs> well, you know, I have <laughs> yeah, like I a little. I, um, you know, um, there might be. Yes, there might be mini mannequins, um, lots of miniature mannequins, uh, uh, other mannequins that come into the show that start, you know, uh, coming in on on Thomas and the mannequins relationship. There might be a different mannequin that looks like someone else. Maybe one that looks like Liam. Maybe Liam is a Liam mannequin. mannequin. <laughs> Maybe Liam actually is a mannequin, and we just didn't know it all along. And everyone has been a mannequin this in a weird Maybe way. Maybe everyone's a mannequin. <laughs> Maybe everyone's maybe, a mannequin. Maybe everyone's a mannequin. Maybe you're not even. Maybe I'm not even an actor. I'm just CGI'd. <laughs> We're just a mannequin. They're just doing mannequins. Mannequins talking to mannequins, and then they CGI everything, and you you think it's real. Yeah. That's about it. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah. Matthew. Thank you so much. Awesome. It was great, so talking great talking to you. To you. you too. Yeah. We'll see you soon.